Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks for all of the evangelists who wrote down an account of the miracle of the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We especially give you thanks today for St. Luke, the author of the Gospel according to St. Luke and Acts of the Apostles. Amen. So, we're starting a new series uh, on the Acts of the Apostles. And it's going to be, a, I think it's a three-part series this month because, you know, you don't, teach, uh, you don't teach formation on Easter Sunday because there's no time for it. So, um, the uh, Acts is a really incredible book in the Bible that we don't get a chance to dig into enough. And so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about how the church uses acts in our liturgy. I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of an overview of the Acts of the Apostles. And this is thanks to Dr. Garwood Anderson, the Dean and Provost of Neshota House. Uh, this is actually his outline that he gave us to teach us how to do outlines on books of the Bible. So this isn't my work, it's his. don't want to take credit for something that's not mine. If anyone wants a copy, let me know. Uh, I can send it to you because it's a great um, overview of all the really important parts in Acts and what happens. Uh, and then we're going to talk about two parts of Acts. One we read today and another one comes up in chapter 15 that um, are really incredible. And I think speak powerfully to us today. Okay. So if you noticed today, there was no lesson in the Old Testament. We had Acts. And then we had the letter from, uh, first letter from John, and then we had the gospel from St. John. In the Easter season, the church, and I, I looked this up and I couldn't really find a, a perfect answer, so I apologize. In the Easter season, the church shifts from using the Old Testament, a psalm, and an, uh, an epistle, to using the Acts of the Apostles in Easter, a psalm, an epistle, and then a reading from the gospel for our lectionary. So what we have is uh, we read through a good portion of Acts in, um, in the Easter season. And we read something really incredible today that in a lot of churches is going to be mis, um, misinterpreted. And I'm going to get to that in a couple minutes because I want to juxtapose that to what happens in chapter 15. So we use the Acts uh, of the Apostles in liturgy throughout the Easter season. So pay attention. You're going to hear a lot of great stories. Uh, I consider Acts of the Apostles a continuation of Luke's gospel. And it is... I, I preached this a few months ago. I said that the gospel is still being written by the church. The good news of Jesus is still being written by the church because we, our call is still to continue to evangelize and make new Christians. And as the saying is at Redeemer, to make new Christians and to make all Christians new. So the gospel is continuing to be written on our hearts and in our lives. And Acts is the inception of the church. The first great council of the church happens in chapter 15, which we'll talk about today. So the Acts of the Apostles um, is an incredible story of what happens right after Jesus ascends into heaven and leaves the apostles in charge of his mission to spread the good news to the entire world. So, uh, approximate, uh, the, of course, we said the author is Luke. The approximate date um, Acts is written is probably between 75 and 85 AD. Um, it may have been written with the Gospel according to St. Luke, but most likely was written afterwards. In both Luke and Acts, you hear about the great Theophilus. He's writing for Theophilus. So Theophilus is his publisher, like Zondervan would be nowadays, okay? So Theophilus is probably a very wealthy convert to the faith. He's probably a leader of a house church, especially uh, the more wealthy people would, would turn their large houses into churches for people to gather in so they didn't get arrested and killed by the Roman authorities. And Luke's probably writing uh, 
the gospel according to St. Luke for that church and for Theophilus's growing uh, community of Christians. Okay? They're not sure where Luke was writing from, but it's possible it could have been uh, Syria, Antioch, uh, uh, also it could have been Greece or Rome where Luke is writing from. Because remember, Luke is traveling with St. Paul a lot. And then if we get into the, the structure of, the, of the, the, the book itself, it's a two-part structure. The mission to the Jewish world, the mission of the church to the Jewish world, which is part one, and then part two, which begins in chapter 12, verse 25, the Christian mission to the Gentile world. And so, you, and you'll see that inter, interspersed a little bit. Some major events, uh, Acts 2 through 6, uh, you have the earliest days of the church in Jerusalem. Um, and then chapter 6 through 9, you have critical events in the lives of three pivotal figures. The martyrdom of Stephen, the early ministry of Philip, and the conversion of St. Paul from Saul to Paul. And then the third section of part one, advances of the gospel in Palestine and Syria. So the ministry of Peter, the church in Antioch and Syria, and the divine intervention on behalf of the Jerusalem church. Then you have part two, the first missionary journey and the Jerusalem council, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today. Then the second section, two Western missionary journeys, so you have the, uh, the missions of, of Paul to the West, uh, to Greece, and uh, Paul hoped eventually to go to Spain. Um, we're not sure if he made it or not. Some people think he did, some people think he didn't. Of course, uh, there is a great tradition that St. James made it to Spain, and that's the, um, what's the name of the walk? The, who can jog my memory? the long, long walk from in Spain to the church has a thurible about the size of this room that they swing all over the place. It's something I want to do uh, someday. But I forgot the name of it. Um, and then uh, from Jerusalem to Rome. And so one of the things uh, that, that helps with the dating of Acts of the Apostles is that Paul's um, martyrdom is not accounted for in Acts. And so the question is, was it written before Paul's martyrdom or after, and of course, we can't really know uh, for sure. So, that's a, an overview of, of the Acts of the Apostles, a very brief one. Jim, yeah? Camino de Santiago. Camino de Santiago. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, the Camino de Santiago. Yeah, yeah, and Santiago um, is St. James in Spanish. And I remember the first time uh, we were doing, uh, well, not the first time, but the first time we got readings from the letter of James in a, in a uh, Bible school we were doing in the Dominican Republic, I couldn't figure out where the heck St. James was in the Spanish Bible because I was looking for St. Jaime or something like that, <laughs> and it was Santiago, so it was, a, it was a real learning moment. Now to the reading today. Um, Acts 4, 32 to 35, the company of those who believed were of one heart, Father Charleston talked about this in the announcement too. The company of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to each as any had need. This text has been misused as an apologetic for socialism and for communism by a lot of people in the church. It has been misused. Now here's the reason why I say it's been misused. Where in that reading do you hear anything about people being forced to give up something? What you hear in this reading is a miracle of generosity and fellowship empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so if you ever hear someone preach, this is why we need to have um, universal health care or something along those lines, that's a government thing. Whether you're for universal health care or against it, it has nothing to do with your faith. It's a government thing. This is much like Father Charleston 
and mine and Deacon David's and Father Ralph's and Father Fred in the past and Father Marsden's in the past discretionary fund. What you have, what a, what a discretionary fund is, is is intended to help parishioners in need. And so if you have extra that you want to give to the church on top of your tithe, because maybe you tithed $5,000 this year, but because you made, you had a really great year, you have an extra three you'd like to give. And you want to give that to a discretionary fund of one of the priests. You're entrusting your extra gift to go to someone who is in great need. In, uh, in times of COVID that we're in now, we receive calls often from people who are in, who say they are in need, who are not parishioners, but who will try to get money out of us. And so we have to do a great deal of diligence in each of those interactions so that we make sure this is truly a person who is in need. And often, the easiest way to say this is, I'm sorry, our discretionary accounts are for parishioners in need. If you would like to come to Redeemer and become a member of the church so we can meet and talk to you, here's, our op here's when we're open, here's when we have masses, That's please come. It is, and you know what? Very few people have taken us up who have been asking, but those who have, have become members. Wow. And there are several who we've been able to help through our discretionary funds to become members of this church. And it's huge. So very much like what's happening here in Acts of the Apostles that we read today, you have people entrusting what they have through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit to the apostles and to the church so that all will be on basically an equal ground and be able to take care of everyone. And so you've got a, a, a pretty large community of people, not a city, but a pretty large community of people coming together to do this. We do this in a lot of ways. Anit is here and she's the head of our mission and outreach committee. Our mission and outreach committee, uh, Redeemer tithes 10% of two years ago's income for accounting purposes back into our community. I believe that's Dr. Asplin in the back of the room and he's here and he knows of Day for Hope and, uh, and how wonderful the Day for Hope ministry is because I know he's met with Pam Hahn recently and we're doing Day for Hope this year on July 17th. And so that's another way that we are able to do that. And so in, in as many ways are, are, uh, that are possible and, and what Father Charleston challenged us to today to have 50 days of Easter that, that we work as hard as Easter as we have on Lent is, inc is an incredible and beautiful challenge to go out and to be the salt of the earth, to be the light, to attract people to Jesus Christ. That's what we're reading about in this section of Acts. However, we get to Acts chapter 15, and we see, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Acts. And so it's not as though we're expected to continue on that legacy, but we must remember that even now, 2,000 years later, we would not be where we are if it weren't for the original wealthy and, yeah. those, and that's exactly the root of what we benefit from. Absolutely. We're all, yeah, we're the, all in need. Yeah. And that's who they were doing this for is us. Yep, absolutely. Steve said that the, the this is for those of people who are watching at home later on this week. Uh, we're the beneficiaries of what we hear in, in the Acts of the Apostles in that reading. And that, that legacy is passed down to us. And that legacy might not look ex identical as we go forward. And, and so it's interesting. So we get to, to Acts chapter 15. And we have the first council of the church, right? Like the Council of Nicaea. This one's not as official. Because the church isn't as official yet. Where did I put my water? But this is the Council of Jerusalem that we read about. And I'm going to read a little bit to you. From Acts chapter 15. 
Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, and you cannot be saved, then you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small discussion and debate with them, I love that proper uh, polite language, had no small discussion and debate with them. In other words, there was a heated argument between them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and they passed both uh, through Phoenicia and Samaria, and they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. So Paul's talking about, these Gentiles are becoming Christians. This is fantastic, and the believers are rejoicing. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and all the apostles and the elders and reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered, ordered to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. And then there's, and then we hear, we're going to hear from Peter in a minute, but do you see the difference between the grace of God being extended like a hand to a wounded, sick, dying person, Paul, and the regimented, you must do X, Y, and Z in order to be a Christian. Now, this always makes the confirmation class giggle. But if you're a grown man and you've not been circumcised yet, and you've got to get circumcised in order to go to church on Sunday, there'd be even less men in church than there are now in our modern time. For sure. You'd have to have like Billy Graham on steroids to convince a whole bunch of men to go get circumcised to go to church. Right? And so Paul knows this. And Paul knows that those covenants have all been made whole in the power of the Holy Spirit and through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So while those covenants can still be kept, the totality of the covenant with God is in a relationship with Jesus through the church. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, this is one of the coolest things about the Acts of the Apostles. You are reading sermons from Peter, from Paul, from James, from Philip, from Stephen. You're reading the first sermons of the church in this book. My, Peter says, my brother, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you. That I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would bear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them and among the Gentiles. After they finished, James replied. So now James stands up. My brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other people, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, over whom my name has been called, thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known 
from long ago. And that's from Jeremiah and Amos. So even back then, they quote scripture when they're preaching, just like we do today. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he's been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so even though they're doing this like huge change for Jews to say you don't have to be circumcised, there's still, there's still some kosher laws and some not eating meat sacrificed to idols that are in there. And then later in Acts, even those things start to fade away. Actually in Paul's letters, Paul talks about if you're around people who don't want to eat meat sacrificed to idols because that's their piety, honor them. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. If you're among believers who eat meat that's sacrificed to idols, join them. Because you're not trying to browbeat them into faith. That's what Paul says in Corinthians, I'm pretty sure. And so, if you want to, I'll go into the sacrifice to idols. All butchers had a sacrifice to an idol in order to be a butcher. There's Roman, Roman like, Romans had all sorts of like baby gods that you had to like, if you were a butcher, you, you sacrificed to the, this certain Roman god. And if you were a woodworker, you sacrificed to this certain god in order to be able to trade. And so when Jesus talks about, you know, there's going to be division amongst your family, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, son against father. What if you're the son of a butcher and you become a Christian so you can no longer sacrifice to that idol? You can't take on your father's trade, which means you can't care for the family. You can see how that might cause some problems in a family. And so these are the types of things that get opened up for us in the Acts of the Apostles. And to put it on us a little bit, look at how good they had it in chapter 4, and look at the division that happens just 11 chapters later, that you have issues going on. And so I think one of the things that we can take from that is that there are people who worship differently than us. And there are people who, uh, who are in different denominations than we are. That doesn't mean that we uh, should throw them out and say they're no good. What it means is we should honor them when we're around them and they should honor us when they're, when they're in our place of worship. And we should have discussions in a loving and uh, creative way as opposed to arguments in a modern and uh, social media kind of way, for lack of a better term. That's all I have for the Acts, and I think David, um, Deacon David is going to be teaching on Acts uh, and also Father Wilson later this month, so that will be the rest of the rector's classes. I believe Father Wilson is actually teaching uh, on the, the conversion in Pentecost and the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, One of the things that we see in Acts is that the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit is so palpable in the disciples and in what's going on in the Acts of the Apostles. And we can talk about that and, and whether or not that power is still with us today. Spoiler, it is. It is. So for those of you at home, I hope you really enjoyed the class today. I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless.